Hey everyone, it's Sarah from the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before we get going on the podcast, I want to talk to you really quick about Linens and Hutch. Linens and Hutch is a family-owned company. They specialize in soft and cozy, high-quality, everything for your bed products at the best possible price. And that is true because right now, if you go to linensandhutch.com, you can get 70% off their entire website. 70% off and free shipping. Just enter the promo code GSMCBOOK, G-S-M-C-B-O-O-K. By designing and working directly with expert manufacturers, they are able to cut out the middle person and pass the savings on to you. They offer on-trend colors and patterns that never go out of style. They provide fast, free shipping, and they are so confident that you will love their products that they offer a 100-day trial period money-back money guaranteed. Now, we happen to have their uh, quilted mattress topper Oh my gosh, this thing is, it feels like it's about six inches thick. It's not, but it feels like it. And it is so soft and it has made our bed so comfy. I just, I'm thinking of hibernating this year because I never want to get out of bed. We have their sheets and their comforter and their pillow, their, excuse me, their mattress topper. And oh my goodness. Yeah, I'm telling you, I'm going to stay in bed. At any rate, you can have this wonderful experience as well by going to linensandhutch.com. When you're checking out, use the promo code GSMCBOOK and you will receive 70% off of everything on their website and you'll get free shipping. So check it out and let's go ahead now and talk about some books. Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I have missed you. You may have noticed that I am not just a little, I am very behind. I am incredibly behind. I talked in the last episode about how things have been a little crazy, and they have not gotten any less crazy in the last couple of months. I've been referring to the last couple of months as... 2020 in microcosm. I mean, you know, everything that has happened in 2020 feels like it has happened again or more, just more (laughs) in the last couple of months. I mean, we have had COVID diagnoses in our family. We have had two unexpected deaths in our family, um, health issues, just... (sighs) I can't even I can't even go into all the details because it would take forever and it would take up this entire podcast. And so just know that I have um, really missed doing this podcast. I've just gotten so behind and I apologize profusely for that. Thanks for hanging in there with me. I hope that your 2020 is going well. I hope that it's been going better than ours has. I hope that ours gets better because it's it's been very, very stressful. And, um, you know, if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you know that I have sinus infections anyway, and I have had those, I've had migraines, just all kinds of good stuff, you know, just good stuff. That's, that's, um, that's sarcasm, just in case you didn't hear it in my voice. <laughs> Let's talk about books, shall we? I have an interview from an author um, who has written a memoir. It is a memoir of food addiction. That is the subtitle. The author is Sarah Summers, and the book is called Saving Sarah, a Memoir of Food Addiction. Now, first of all, I can't believe I am this far into the podcast and have never interviewed an author named Sarah. How crazy is that? She has a fabulous name. It happens to be spelled wrong. Yeah, it's missing an H. Um... (laughs) I always think it looks slightly naked when it's missing the H. Um, 
but that's just me. I just happen to be a Sarah with an H and she happens to be a Sarah without an H. But of course, when you say them, they sound just the same. So I won't hold the H-lessness against her. So she's written a memoir. Again, it's called Saving Sarah. And the description is as follows. For nearly 50 years, Sarah Summers suffered from untreated food addiction. In this brutally honest and intimate memoir, she offers readers an inside view of a food addict's mind, showcasing her experiences of obsessive cravings, compulsivity, and powerlessness regarding food, beginning with abnormal eating as a nine-year-old. As her addiction progresses in young adulthood, Summers becomes isolated, masking her shame with self-hatred with her shame and self-hatred with drugs and alcohol. Time and again, she rationalizes why this time will be different, only to have her physical cravings lead to ever worse binges. Even after she is introduced to the solution that will eventually end up saving her, it takes another 26 years before she finally returns, crawling on hands and knees to that solution and learns to live life on life's terms. A raw account of decades-long battle with addiction, Saving Sarah underscores the challenges faced by food addicts of any age and the hope that exists for them all. So, again, it's a memoir. It's very different from the last memoir we spoke of. It's so insightful and so helpful, though, because... Maybe you know someone who has a food addiction of some kind, and this really will help you to understand them better. Um, If you are someone who has a food addiction or who has had a food addiction, then you might see yourself in this book. Maybe you'll find hope in this book. She talks about how she has gotten through this, how she is living now. Her, her Her story really goes up to that point where she gets the help that she needs. And it can be a very difficult read, but it's a read that contains a lot of hope. I mean, you know, when you're reading it from the outside perspective, you sometimes just want to say, well, just do this or just stop doing that, you know, and it can be like that when you know someone with an addiction, just do this, just stop doing that. Um, But what I really appreciate is the hope that is present in this book, the honesty with which Sarah speaks of her experiences, and the fact that her experiences could very easily help someone else or help someone else to understand a loved one who has food addiction. Even if you don't know someone with food addiction, it's still a really good read and I found it helpful. I actually found things in the book that were helpful for my own way of thinking about food. Um, So I, I could appreciate it from that level, but also to just understand what might be going on in the minds of someone who does have a food addiction and learning to understand them in a a better way than what I already or did did or did not, how I already did or did not understand that person. Sarah currently now lives in France. So I got to do another international call and talk to her in France. This is my... um, my way of traveling <laughs> during COVID, even before COVID. But, you know, I talk to authors who live on different continents and then I feel like I've I've gone on a little bit of an adventure. So that was very cool. She was describing what she was looking at outside her window and um, we'd been emailing back and forth before the interview and she was in Paris and she was on vacation outside of Paris. And I was like, oh, that just sounds lovely. So enough of me rambling about France um, and Paris and places I've never been. Let's go ahead and turn now to the interview. Again, the author is Sarah Summers. The book is called Saving Sarah, a Memoir of Food Addiction. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here. I am excited to have you here. My, My first comment is that you are my first Sarah that I have interviewed for the podcast, which is pretty crazy um so good kudos on the name (laughs) thank you very much thank you very much and I don't have an H which is even more unusual yeah it it always I always say it looks naked without the H um because I do have an H so (laughs) (laughs) 
But we are here to talk about your book. Uh, it's called Saving Sarah, A Memoir of Food Addiction. Before we get to the book, though, if you would start by sharing a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I am 73 years old tomorrow is my birthday. And I have... Happy uh, birthday! Thank you very much. It's going to be a wonderful birthday. Uh, I grew up actually on the East Coast and moved out to California when I was about 22 and had most of my adulthood there. I was a practicing psych psychotherapist. And when I retired, I thought, oh, I'll just come to Paris for a, a while and try and learn some French. And that was in 2014. And I'm still here because it turned out to be a wonderful move, a wonderful city. And it's given me, they have lots of writing classes here that's very creative. And um, it's kind of turned a new faucet on in me to do things I had never done before. So I think that's the most important thing about me was relates to this book. Very cool. So I'm guessing that in six years, you've learned more than a little French. <laughs> You know, I have learned more than a little. I'm still not very good. My friends tease me, but I've convinced that once your brain goes past a certain age, it's very hard. So I'm proud of what I have learned. And it just it's one of those things you just have to keep practicing, practicing, or it goes away. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, give an overview of the memoir, Saving Sarah. Well, the memoir covers my life mostly from about the uh, eight years old until I'm about 65 or 66. Um, I, was a, I have been a food addict all my life. I still consider myself one, but I consider myself recovered at this point. Um, and my, I had a very good, I had a good life in the sense that um, my parents uh, were very smart. My father taught at Princeton and there was money. And so I, I got sent to good schools and I got, went to a good college and I got to spend time during university in uh, both France and Italy. So I, I really wasn't deprived of things, but uh, I was very isolated and very lonely very early on because I was a food addict and didn't know what was wrong with me. I just felt different. And the more I felt different, the more I pulled away or I tried way too hard to become part of and children don't take kindly to that. So um, I grew up just not knowing very well how to navigate life and um and it became and and I detail this in the book it really became a a journey of trying to figure out what was wrong with me and um, I I did most of the usual things I was a you know I was I came out of those 1960s 70s hippie years and I wanted to go to India I thought maybe the answer was there I didn't get there but I tried I thought it was in meditation books. I thought it was a lot of places. And um, it just never occurred to me. It was the food I was eating. And even when I did figure that out or was told in, in pretty good, clear words that it's the food you're eating, it's, it's your carbohydrate sensitive, you're allergic, you can't eat this food and not get fat and not feel crazy inside it it makes you feel certain things that are and so i just kept struggling and fighting what the truth was and um and i detail all of that in a way that i hoped that if another person was struggling like i had been that they might recognize themselves um i believe that people like me don't listen to people who don't have the same problems. So I wanted others to identify with my struggle and know that they weren't alone. And at the same time, I also wanted um, doctors and therapists and family members to, I wanted to write in such a way that maybe they would have a glimmer 
of understanding what goes on inside um, a food addict when they're seeming like they're like there's so much trouble. And I was a lot of trouble to my family. Um, so I learned a lot about myself during that, not things that I could use until I finally found a 12 step program. Well, I found it long before I, I joined it. I just didn't like it. Um, but when I finally surrendered to the fact that, yes, I am, I am carbohydrate sensitive. I can't have grains. I can't eat sugar in either liquid or hard form. Um, then my life began to change because I, it, I, I wasn't putting poison in my system. And the book sort of ends there when I, when the positive thing happens and I, have an epilogue to try and let people know how very, very much my life changed in the next 15 years. Um, and I hope that answers your question, what it details and what I, what I tried to do and what I hope I did do. So that gives you a bit of insight into Sarah and into this memoir. We are going to go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. More when we come back with Sarah and talking about food addiction, talking about addictions in general, uh, but really talking about this memoir and her experiences. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast, and I'll be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with author Sarah Summers about her memoir, Saving Sarah. Let's go ahead and get back to that interview. You know, you cover this in, in the book, but a little bit. So, you know, we've recognized things like alcoholism as a disease for a while, not maybe as long as we should have, but even though um, food addiction is now recognized in medical terms as being a disease, as being an addiction, we still have a lot of misunderstandings about it. I think um, a lot of people still have that attitude of kind of like, well, just don't eat and you'll, you know, just, right. just don't eat, just don't do that. And you, you know, you'll lose weight or, you know, just, just, there's so many different versions of just do X, Y, Z and you'll lose weight. Exactly. So, um, can you talk a little bit about that process for you of figuring, you know, of navigating this food addiction in a world that doesn't always understand it. Well, when I was young, there wasn't even the word food addiction. And I, being raised, be, raised in Princeton behind Ivy League walls, I thought of myself as kind of naive. I'd never even knew much about alcoholism until I was actually in university. And, um, but I knew about dieting and everybody, all the women dieted. My mother wasn't heavy, so family members didn't diet, but, um, I read about it all the time. And so I was, was raised thinking that that was the answer. If you have a weight problem, you find the diet that works for you. And it's that was it was a equals b and you're and solved so the fact that it didn't work for me caused me to think that i really was a failure and so i kept trying different diets and different diets and it wasn't until i was probably in my late 20s early 30s and was actually had finished going to graduate school um starting to work as a therapist i knew a little bit about alcoholism um, and I began, I began to read, you know, the amount of money that was put into the diet industry and 
the percentage of success that that industry had, and it's very, very low. And at the same time, I, my sister um, had, who was getting her PhD at Harvard, um, had stumbled on this 12-step program and wrote me about it. And, um, and basically the program said, diets won't work for people like me, that, uh, that I have a, a, a much bigger problem that, than that. It's not just taking off a few pounds and then I can eat like I used to eat. It's, it was that I had to really understand that I had to change my behaviors completely. And I had to change the foods I put in my body completely. Um, there was so much I had to change and I didn't like it. I just wanted to be thin. I wanted to eat what I wanted to eat whenever I wanted to eat it. And the irony, of course, of that was that I was doing that. I was eating whatever I wanted to eat whenever I wanted to eat it. And it was not making me thin. I, I had this fallacy that thin people did that. It, and I, I refused to look at the truth. So it really, um, it wasn't until I started doing research on my own because I was a therapist on the 12 step programs, on alcoholism, on drug addiction, that I began to see that there were um, things that people are powerless over. You can't, you, you, if you get cancer, you can't just get on a diet and make cancer go away. You follow certain directions. If you have a lung disease, if you have, you need oxygen, you need help. You have to get the doctor, you have to get oxygen. And that this really was no different. But it, it, but society and people and friends, most of my loved ones, they just couldn't see it the same way. And I was a person that needed a lot of support. I just couldn't, I wasn't someone who could just go out on my own and say, I'm going to do this and the to heck with all of you. And um, so I just kept stumbling and stumbling and stumbling and until it just nothing worked. And, you know, somebody asked me actually today, what, what made the difference? What, when you finally just said, I'm, I'm going to do it, what I'm, what I was told to do. I don't know. I don't really know, except for that. I just think I was so sick and tired of being sick and tired and depressed and wanting to kill myself and all the other things that come with this disease, um, that I just did something different. Uh, one of the things also that my generation really embraced was psychotherapy. And most psychotherapies encourage having, an, having a brainstorm, having an intuition, having feelings, and then making a plan of action based on those feelings. And that does not work for addicts. Um, addicts need to change their behavior first, and then their feelings follow. And that was something that was difficult for me, and I think is difficult for a lot of food addicts especially, is that you're not going to feel good. You're not going to feel like your success. In fact, you might feel terrible because you're in withdrawal when you first stop eating sugar and grains and are told to do certain things. But that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. You're just changing behavior and it's hard. And in my case, I had to change a lot of behaviors. Um, but as, you know, just like getting A's in school, once the rewards started coming in, then it just got easier and easier to want to continue. And uh, I would say today, you know, my life is 180 degrees differently. I am probably the same person inside. I just don't act like a jerk and I follow directions. And, you know, for instance, the lockdown here in Paris um, was a little, was much more severe in the beginning than anywhere in the United States, but I felt very prepared for it. I had been taught how to, uh, how to, plan ahead, prepare, make sure there was enough food in my house, how to stay connected to the world. I'd been using Zoom for a couple of years. I was teaching all my friends how to use Zoom. Um, since I'd been writing for four years, I was alone with my computer. I felt completely prepared and had not a difficult time at all with the lockdown. 
Um, so it's really proved to be a program that healed my food addiction, but also that I was able to translate into many areas, most areas of my life, because it works. Yeah, thank you for that. What then made you decide to sit down and write a memoir about these experiences? I never actually sat down and decided to write a memoir. What happened was because Paris is so, there's so many things going on creative wise. And I started taking writing classes. I had always thought that I wanted to be a writer, but because the food addiction held me back in so many ways, I never really had anything to say that wasn't complainy or blame somebody else for my woes. Um, but here I started taking classes and um, started writing and I was told, you know, keep doing it. You're good. You keep doing it. And then I took a week long writing course it's called the Paris Writers Workshop. And I met an agent there who read about 10 pages of some of these memories that I've been writing about from my childhood and the, and the food. And she really encouraged me to write a book. Do you think you can do it, Sarah? I said, of course, without knowing what I was saying. And, um, and I did, I, I just got to work on it. And then I began to realize that it's hard work. And she put me in touch with a, a coach. Um, and I had to learn a lot. I had to learn, I have a good voice, I'm a good storyteller, but I knew nothing about creating a scene. I knew nothing about dialogue. So this coach really had to teach me how to write. And I, several times I thought, why am I doing this? Which is a really good question. And the answer was that I felt so grateful for all the people who had stood by me when I was trying to find my way, who kept pushing me in the direction of this 12-step program, who really, um, it's going to sound hokey, but I mean it in the most positive way, who really loved me when I was a bit unlovable. And I felt like I wanted to pass it on. I wanted to pass on that there was hope that this is really, food addiction is real. It's a real disease. It's in the DSM-5 um, with both binging, uh, bulimia, and anorexia. They all have their own numbers now. Um, and all my research said there was no book where a person just wrote, this is what I was thinking. This is what it was like. This is what it took away from me. This is what it robbed me of. And I managed to find my way through it. And um, and I've got myself into recovery. I've got a good life. And I don't forget for a minute that I could go backwards. I could, I could go back in an instant. If I left this interview and went and found some ice cream and ate it, I don't know that I'd be back here, you know, doing what I do today, tomorrow. I think it's that serious an addiction. And that's why every time I felt like I wanted to stop and I would say, why are you doing this, Sarah? That was my answer. And um, I'm not, you know, I'm not somebody who's altruistic by nature, but um, it felt right. It felt right to do. And um and I learned so much. I learned so much about myself. It, the hardest parts writing it were about my childhood and trying to not place blame anywhere on anyone, you know, that it's a disease and everybody becomes a victim to it. So I did it. And you should have seen my face when the first book came out and I actually saw it in print. It was, I couldn't believe it. I, I'm really proud of it, and I'm really proud that I did it. And uh, well, you live in the Bay Area, I think. Uh, you probably saw the review that was in the San Francisco Chronicle on July 8th. Um, that made me. That was really wonderful. Yeah, I I actually live in the Sacramento area now. Um, used to live in the Bay Area, but um, okay. What what I appreciate about memoirs and this memoir in particular is that, I mean, you can read it, you can read a book on food addiction and there, you know, I'm sure there's 
there, there are books out there that are more sort of self-help books on food addiction. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but memoirs really give you that personal insight. And you were talking about creating a scene and doing dialogue, and you do such a lovely job in the book of um, writing your story. It, it's a difficult topic, and it, it's not, you know, it's not a fun topic. But you, you write in a way that's engaging, that that allows the reader to enter into that world and um, see what your experience was like. So that that's something that I really appreciated about the book. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and take our second break of the podcast. When we come back, Sarah will be talking about what she hopes readers might take from reading this memoir and hearing about her experiences. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. Visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before we get back to the interview with Sarah Summers, can I just tell you something that I I notice more and more? I mean, I always knew that I talked with my hands, but since starting a podcast, I can't believe how much I talk with my hands while sitting by myself in the studio. I have no idea why I talk with my hands so much more when I am recording a podcast. Is it because I'm nervous? Is it because it helps me get some of my thoughts out? I don't know. But... Here I am, hands gesturing madly, and I thought, I look silly, and I thought I would share that with you. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get back to the interview. What do you hope that readers, I mean, obviously you, you said you wrote this hoping that people who have similar experiences might be able to see that experience in your memoir. What about people who don't have food addiction? What are you hoping that they might take away from the book? I don't think somebody would just pick it up unless they had some connection to food addiction I mean because the words are right on the cover um I did get a really nice blurb from Annie Lamott so people who like her might want to read it but um I, I I really hoped that I could address four different audiences and it's hard to do it one obviously was to try to get people to know that they weren't alone. But I also wanted parents to know that there's re- there's a real problem, you know, and just telling people to pull their bootstraps up or um, punishing them, taking away allowances. That's what happened when I was a child, it probably doesn't happen now, but um, it just doesn't work, you know, that they need love and they need understanding and listening, even if they don't seem like they're appreciating it they really are down deep and uh, that I remember the few people who just listened to me and held me while I cried and they didn't know what was wrong but they let me know they really cared about me and that a a camp um, director was one of those people Um, a teacher was one of those people people that really had nothing except for they cared about me um, I had a couple of therapist friends read the book, and they all believe one woman runs a food addictions um, clinic in um, Ontario, in Montreal, I think, or Toronto, and 
they both hope that therapists read this book, that it will help them work with food addiction much, much better if they can get inside the skin of a food addict, someone who will let them inside their skin. And I think I do that. Um, I plan when I, if I, if and when I can ever get back to California, I plan to give a couple of copies to, I, even though I never, I really had trouble with my sister, I would watch her from afar very carefully. And, and um, I might make fun of, I might've made fun of her to my friends, but she was doing something right when it came to her weight because she had got, gotten much larger than me and she was a normal weight. Uh, for the last 28 years. And, um, you know, she's the one that introduced me to this Gray Sheeters Anonymous. And she and I now have a relationship. And I believe that we have a relationship because we've both been in this program and we both um, want to be better people. We want we want to be better family members. We don't, I think we're both too old to want to win a a fight at this point. And um, it's been one of the greatest, most rewarding things of my life that she and I are, are have gotten together and learned how to accept each other. You know, I think we both wanted each other to change and be more like the other person and, and that that would somehow um, make me, if she was more like me, then I'd be okay. And for me to say, she doesn't have to be like me. She's just the way she is. And if you want a friendship with her, Sarah, you're just going to take her the way she is. And it turns out that taking her the way she is is very, very interesting. She's she's very political. Uh, she was a professor at the University of Michigan. And she teaches me so much about uh, being active politically, even over here and she teaches me a lot about things that I know nothing about. And I get to teach her a little bit about psychotherapy and about my writing. And I think she's very proud of me and I'm very proud of her. And who ever thought that would happen? Not me. Well, it, it's wonderful that you were able to, you were both able to come to a, a, a different place that way. Um, you mentioned Gray Sheeters Anonymous. Um, what is the story behind that name because it makes it makes no sense when you just see it. <laughs> it's thank you for asking. That's a great question because it is actually the only 12-step program that does not have the problem in the title. It has the solution in the title. All the other ones, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, Drug Addicts Anonymous, blah, blah, blah. Um, when the when Overeaters Anonymous was first founded in 1963, they had one food plan. It was printed on a gray sheet, and um, it it had some degree of success at that point. But it started involving itself with nutrition instead of just saying this is a life and death issue. Go go figure out your other stuff with a doctor. Um, it started developing different plans and told people, choose your plan, um, which to me was laughable. I, I, I couldn't choose a plan. That was my problem is that I was always trying to choose the one that had the foods I wanted to eat, but were harmful to me. So around 1977, some people in Massachusetts, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I think, you know, this might be a bit apocryphal. I'm not absolutely sure what the exact story is. But um, I was told they just stood up and said, we're leaving this program, this, this meeting. We're going to go start a meeting based on the very first food plan that follows the tenets of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what they did. And it's grown. And they called themselves Grace Eaters Anonymous because they followed this food plan on a gray sheet. And nothing has changed. Just like... Um, the Alcoholics Anonymous would never change the first 164 pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Nothing changes on that gray sheet. And um, so it's still used. I still use it. I keep a copy in my kitchen and have a tiny little, I think I know it by heart, but you never know. Um, and so that's how the name came to be. And it's and it's not, we, we are very clear that the 
our parent program is Alcoholics Anonymous, and we find we follow those tenants, and that we're not the same as the other food programs, um, mostly because we follow a very strong no matter what. We do this no matter what, just the way alcoholics don't drink no matter what happens in their lives. So um, you can look it up on a, it's on the, um, you can Google graysheet.org and you'll come up with the website, which tells a, gives a lot of information, also tells a lot of stories and has a long list of meetings, most of which are on Zoom right now. Um, so you can go to a meeting almost anywhere in the world um, and meet gray sheeters anywhere, anywhere in the world, which is kind of fun for us. Um, so that's a good place to go to find out more about it. Apocryphal or not, it's a great story, but, <laughs> you know, so the backstory is great, although still, you know, a little more difficult to find <laughs> for people looking that's for the support group. So another reason I wrote so, the book. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You uh, wrote this memoir. You said you, you have an epilogue, but are you considering doing a follow-up memoir or are you going to? Do you want to write other kinds of books? What are your plans in terms of writing going forward? Well, I have two things that one I'm thinking about and one I'm doing. Ever since the pandemic broke out, I well, I've been writing a blog since I've been here in Paris called Out My Window. And I write about Things I go to that you might not go to if you spent, if you're an American, you just come here for five or six days that you might not see. So I, I go into detail. But if something, if a great book comes across my way, I'll write about that. So I've been writing about a lot of different things. But when the pandemic started, I tried to the best of my ability to write what was going on here what was going, what I was reading was going on in the United States and other countries and my feelings about what was going on in those places. And I was trying to keep a record, trying to keep it up twice a week. Um, my computer decided to break right in the middle of that. So it didn't stick with two, twice a week, but I've been really working at it and wondering if if uh, at some point I want, might want to go backwards and turn it into something um, to talk about what it was like going through this. Uh, I, I know books are starting to trickle out with, with stuff about the pandemic, you know, slowly. I just finished a mystery book by Val McDermott and her, the book ends just as they're about to go into lockdown. So she clearly wrote it during lockdown. And um, and then the other thing that I was thinking about was trying to compile a series of stories of other people that I would write the introduction and I would say why I chose these people, but to have more members tell their stories, not in lengthy terms like me, but more, you know, what it was like you know, what was their turning point and what what they're like now um, and pulling that together. Um, and it, when I mention that to people, they really like the idea. I, I'm not ready at, the, at this point to do that. I need some time. I'm also doing some other writing projects for my program anonymously. So I need to finish those uh, first. But um I'm also, I, you probably know this, but Judy Collins wrote a book called Cravings and about her food addiction. And um, she says she's in Grace Sheeters Anonymous. So she and I have actually, she's in New York, but we're going to do a conversation together for the American Library in Paris, which is on Zoom. Anybody can come. You, you have to go on to the American Library in Paris website. Um, so oh, I that, lost your audio. <laughs> you lost my audio. I lost. Yeah, can you, you hear me said, now? Uh, Yeah, I can hear you now. You had just said that you and Judy were going to do uh, something in New York, and then I lost your audio. <laughs> ah, uh, Judy, being in New York and me being in Paris, we're going to do a conversation about food addiction together for the American Library in Paris on one of their, they're staying with Zoom for the fall events. 
so neither one of us have to go anywhere. So um, I'm looking forward to that to see what comes out of it and whether she and I might collaborate on anything. But that's in my head. We'll see what comes out of it. But those well, are it's really exciting. Yes, it's really exciting. Um, let's see. Uh, so you were uh, a therapist for much of your career, um, and now you write blog, a blog and you've written a memoir, but did you ever think about writing growing up? Is it something that you wanted to do, or did this just come to you as part of the, the blog, blogging experience and then writing about your own um, experiences with food addiction? I'm going to try and answer that as truthfully as I can, because yes, I wanted to write, but I don't think I really wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be noticed. I wanted people to like me or adore me. And I, uh, I liked words. So I had that as my, that was the way I was going to do it. But when I read other writers, memoirs and and the way they were struck by the writing blog i didn't have that i never felt like i've got to put this down in writing um i i i go listen to people like annie lamott a lot because i i'm getting to know her and i really enjoy her books and the things that she talks about that she's learned over the time i thought I I wanted to be a writer for all the wrong reasons, and I it was all about me. So, and and I really had nothing to say. And that's what food addiction really robs you of thinking clearly because you're so concentrated on thinking about what's wrong with you and and how can you get better and and how can you find somebody to love you and um it's it's there's no room for any creative. Uh, thoughts. That was my experience. So when I was here in Paris, I had started writing some um, columns for the Piedmont Post in, um, you know, Piedmont next to Oakland. And I had done some other things that were very short, but I, I didn't have any stick to it. Uh, I, the idea of just doing it week after week after week didn't appeal to me. Um, and that's all changed. I think really taking these writing classes and um, and realizing that I have a voice and, and what the teachers would say is that's not teachable. The rest of the stuff is a craft. Yeah. You can learn how to write. You can learn how to do dialogue. You can learn how to create a scene. Have a voice. Um, you either have it or you don't. So I've been given a gift and probably I should keep using it. And, you know, I do have another blog just on food addiction, which I've named after the book, saving-sarah.org. And I try to, my best to keep it interactive, have people write me questions and that would be my, what I would write about next. Um, but writing two or three blogs a week, it's hard. For me, um, I like to be outside at times. So I I like the idea and I am a person now who's very comfortable being alone for long periods of time. I don't think I could have written earlier, even if I'd wanted to be, because I wasn't comfortable being alone with myself. But other than those two projects that, that are percolating in my brain at the moment, I... I I haven't really seriously thought about it. Um, I've been getting such wonderful feedback from the book that it makes me want to do something. And and uh, we'll we'll see. <laughs> it's sort of a vague answer, <laughs> but <laughs> no, no. The, I mean, sometimes the answers are vague because that's the way your you know, <laughs> things are going. <laughs> Okie dokie, time for our last break of the podcast. When we come back, uh, Sarah will be talking about what books, in addition to Val McDermott, she enjoys reading. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. 
Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Sarah Summers. Once again, her book is a memoir. It's called Saving Sarah. You have mentioned uh, Val McDermott and Annie Lamott as people that you enjoy reading. Do you have other favorite authors or genres when you want to read for yourself? Well, that question was made me really think, and I realized that most of my younger years, the people that I picked to read were people that would talk about depression, that I would seek out writers that talked about something that made me feel less alone and less freaky. And I would read, I loved really heavy duty movies, you know, like, um, a Swedish guy whose name I can't remember, The Seventh Seal. You remember those movies, and um, which I can't tolerate now. Um, and so I was looking for answers. I looked for genres and authors who would give me answers. And I enjoyed them, but I never found the answers I wanted. My answer was in Grey Sheeters Anonymous. And so today I find that I really like writers who entertain me. So I love mystery writers. I love Val McDermott. I love Peter Robinson. I love, and I love watching all the BBC shows that are made out of it, Morse and Endeavor and all these, these great things. They, they're just so entertaining and I love them. And I try to guess who done it, you know, as early into the book as I can, the lead child, but Somebody like Annie Lamott, she writes, she just, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody feels the same way if they like her. You know, she just speaks to something inside me and to my soul. And I just go, yeah, yeah. So I like that kind of book, too. And I read them less frequently than I do my mysteries. Since I've been here in Paris... I really wanted to know more about Paris and I just stumbled on a book about the Louvre. I think it was just printed 2020 and not about the museum. It's about the building, you know, and, and how it, what it was first built. A building was first built in 12th, 11th century or something and all the different iterations it's gone through. And most of us, when we think of the Louvre, we think of the museum and it's fascinating. And so I, I, because of the American Library in Paris and because they have these author events, of which I'm honored to be one of them this fall, um, they bring through uh, many, many authors who have introduced me into new ways of, of new, new genres that, that are really interesting to me. So I think of my easy listening, if you will, as my mystery books and my thrillers and then then I'll hunker down and I'll read something that uh, where I actually learn something and I love it then I'll go back to my mysteries which easily listening and can go to sleep on I love to read you probably can tell that I went on a vacation this week the, earlier this summer for two weeks and read five books on the vacation so I love to read I love other authors and uh, one thing I am trying to do um, is just if I really like an author is try to, to write a page or two and mimic their style of writing and see what they're doing. Sally Rooney, for instance, you, this Irish 
wonder child, my God, she's not very old and she's written these incredible books. It's really interesting to try and mimic her. Um, it's, uh, so it's, it's in a way I try to educate myself too, um, in writing and bettering my writing. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Where can people, I know you've got the blogs, um, but so where can people find you on the internet? Do you have um, a website uh, or uh, are you active on social media? Where can people find you? On Instagram, I am Saving Sarah the Book. And I have a Facebook page called Saving Sarah the Book. I don't have a web I don't have an author page all by itself. And then I do the blog out my window is www.sarasummers.com. No H on Sarah. And the food addiction one is saving-sarah.org. And um, that's it. I'm not a Twitter person yet. <laughs> I think that's, those right. are the well, best places find me okay thank you um we have covered a variety of topics today but is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like for people to know about the book or about writing or about food addiction anything that we haven't covered i think the only thing that i would like to say and underscore is that I never wanted this book to really be about me, Sarah. I wanted this book to be a story about food addiction and that my story was the one I knew best and that I wanted to make clear that it is a very, very serious disease and that I'm just one of thousands and thousands and maybe more people that suffer from this disease. And so this is really just one story. There's nothing unique about me at all. And I've hopefully tried to stress that in all my interviews that um, th that's the message I wanted to get across. Um, something just went in and out of my head that seemed important, but I didn't latch on to it. So uh, I think, I think that's it, you know, that, that, I know what it was. I was um, listening to Bill Maher one night and he had Nicholas Kristof on as a guest. And Nicholas Kristof was saying that he thought that loneliness and obesity, this was before the pandemic started, um, were the two worst um, diseases happening in America right now. And he, Nicholas quoted a doctor from the um, Harvard School of Medicine saying that by 2030, that 3,000 people would be dying a day from obesity. It, it just the numbers was astronomical to me. Um, the fact that Nicholas Kristof, who I think is uh, a marvelous writer and writes about very important things, was putting this at the top of his list, obesity and loneliness, which do go hand in hand, um, really said to me, Sarah, just you got to get this word out because I think he's right. And people just don't know what's wrong with us when, when we're really heavy or dying because we're so skinny. And uh, I've never suffered for anorexia, but I, all of us have known somebody who's died looking in the mirror thinking they're fat and not eating and and die from not eating. So it, what we're talking about is very, very serious. And I'm just a person that was given the gift of gab, if you will, trying to do my part in saying, this is my story. If you identify with me at all, Look up Gray Sheeters Anonymous. Look up graysheet.org. See if you identify with anything. See if, try it. it. Can't hurt you and you can always go away, but it might help you. And don't be one of those people that in 2030 is dying from obesity and loneliness. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you taking the time. I know it's evening for you. So thank you for taking the time out of your evening to talk to me about your book. Um, it, it was wonderful chatting with you.
Thank you, Sarah. It was wonderful chatting with you. As always, thank you once again to Sarah Summers for taking the time out of her, probably would have been evening, her, um, her Parisian evening. I'll just make that sound fancy um, for taking the time out of her evening to talk with me about her book and for being so incredibly patient waiting for this interview to actually get posted. I'm trying, folks. I am trying. I- I'm going to I'll do better. I promise. Thank you, as always, to you, my listeners, uh, for your patience uh, as I try, (laughs) and hopefully 2020 gets better. But thank you to Sarah for speaking to me about this memoir. I really appreciated her honesty, her storytelling, her um, kind of unflinching way of looking at her experiences, because she wasn't always the... If, if this were a novel, she isn't always the the kind of protagonist that you want to that you want to like. There are times when you're like, man, this this is just this is just hard. Um, so she's unflinching in some of those aspects of her personality that you know maybe aren't the the greatest during her time of struggle with the food addiction and her relationships with her family, especially her parent, well, especially her sister, but um, you know with her parents and how family dynamics fit into that, um, how family systems work in that, and really trying to figure all of this out before some of these concepts that we maybe are more familiar with now had even been introduced. I mean, food addiction wasn't even a thing then. So I really appreciate her ability to look back with such clarity and and present this her story in such a way to make it interesting to read but also very helpful in terms of understanding something that maybe not all of us understand and could learn more about as usual again thank you for joining me i hope you will join me again next time when i will be be well (laughs) i don't know where that came from when i will be speaking with author Alice Early about her novel, The Moon Always Rising, and, uh, sorry, Alice C. Early uh, about her novel, The Moon Always Rising, and actually this, the timing on this is, is good, even though it's, you know, very late, but uh, now that it's October, it, the timing is good because this does involve a ghost. This is partly a ghost story, partly a lot of other things. You'll have to tune in for the next um, episode to find out what the other things are, but there is a ghost. So, Hope you're having a great week so far. I hope that great week continues. And I hope that that great week also involves plenty of time to go get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.